Over the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I want to talk to you guys about the story of where we've been going with the use of predictive modeling, which is a bit of a new statistical technique, taking advantage of some of the informatics that we now have in the electronic record and some of the large uh, granular database registries, um, such as the uh, ISSG, ESSG. And as I'm discussing it, although I know most of you guys are really uh, spine and orthopedic uh, surgeons, I want you to think about it like uh, as a model of complex disease and expensive disease uh, in our modern healthcare setting, which is uh, slowly running out uh, of money. First, I want to set the background of the public health issue that we have. Um, and this is just from the United States, but I'll tell you the same is true as I travel around the world and go to Japan and Europe. Australia, uh, we have an aging population, uh, 53 million people now over the age of 65. There are going to be 80 million people over 65 by 2050. So our population is getting older. And if you look at it, whether or not you're aggressive about surgery on these patients, uh, you're going to be called upon to evaluate these patients uh, in the clinic setting because there's about a 60% prevalence of curves over, uh, over 10 degrees. That, me that means right now we have 32 million people in the U.S. with uh, adult spinal deformity. So it's not a, not a small public health uh, issue. As an aside, if you think about the aging musculoskeletal system and then you think about the aging cardiovascular system as our, as our population is getting older, then think about the aging neurological and cognitive system. I recently read an estimate in the Harvard Business Review that Alzheimer's disease in the next 10, 20 years is going to cost the economy $1 trillion. So uh, we're going to have a, a population of uh, older, demented uh, people, and that's a huge public health issue that, that may dwarf uh, the burden of the musculoskeletal system. The other issue that we have in the phenomenon is that our, our patients, as they're getting older, our populations are getting older, they're, they're no longer satisfied to move into wheelchairs and to become more disabled. And it's a change in mindset and it's a change in expectation and utilization of the health system. So when I was a kid, I'm 51 years old. When I was a child, I would go to the department store and I would see uh, older people being pushed around by their family. Uh, they had hip issues, they had CHF, et cetera. Uh, now, when you go shopping, right, you don't see that anymore. People are mobile. I don't know how many are here are 50 and older. There are definitely some of them. And, uh, but we don't see that anymore. We see people that are walking around. They have walkers sometimes, but they're, they're mobile. If we look at utilization in terms of procedures, we see number of admissions for ASD has gone up 157%. These numbers are a bit old, but you can see the slope of the line definitely going up. And if you look at actual procedure volume, there are more than 30,000 ASD surgeries performed every year in the United States. If you think of that, somewhere between seventy-five dollars to $125,000 per index procedure, it's a lot of money uh, being spent. And we see a decrease uh, in simple decompressions. We see that's, that's going down. If we look at cost, we see that our older patients are costing us more to operate on, and that's... That's just a very simple correlation, but, and we'll get more into the weeds of how to look at that uh, in a few minutes, but def definitely the older patients, they may spend longer in the ICU, they may spend longer in the hospital, they certainly burden our rehab systems uh, much more, and this is something we haven't even looked at in terms of cost. So whenever you look at cost modeling in ASD, it's not even looking at the rehab cost. That's even harder not to crack uh, than... Um, than overall cost. Well, how do we pay for this? Oh, if you look at most, many of our patients if, uh, that are older, many of our, our if you look at the uh, average age, for example, in uh, ISSG, ESSG, these patients are well over 50 years old. So many of these patients have Medicare. Over 20% of the population is going to be on Medicare uh, insurance in the next few years. And it's not even just the 65, 75-year-olds that we're going to have to care for. We're going to have 19 million people over the age of 85 by 2050. So we're, we're definitely getting older. And the, the spending from Medicare is getting more per patient, probably because of some increased expectation, some realization through research that these procedures can benefit patients. And so we're spending more per Medicare recipient. However, 
you look at the numbers, and this was just adjusted this year from um, the um, uh, U.S. Budget Office. This is from the U.S. government itself. This isn't some outside economist looking at this. Medicare will be insolvent by 2026, and Social Security by about 10 years later. The other phenomenon that we see is in ASD, which is going to have an impact on complications and cost, is that com the complexity of the procedures is increasing. So one interesting phenomenon to look at is look at that inflection point in the utilization of wedge osteotomies uh, in the US. Does anyone remember when the Glassman paper was published in Spine? It's 2005, 2006, uh, starting to link the sagittal plane um, to outcomes. We saw a significant increase in the use of wedge osteotomy. Plus, there's been a lot of fusion being done by that point, a lot of iatrogenic deformity. And the other interesting thing to look at from a utilization standpoint is the older patient population is actually the group where we see the greatest increase in wedge osteotomy, over 65. Then this is some of Justin, uh, Justin Smith's work. If you look at the complication rates in ASD overall, an average, it's about 70%. So we're doing more operations on older people. The general conception is that they're, they're frail uh, and going to have more complications. So what are we doing? These are expensive. We're operating on a lot of older people. There's a high prevalence. There are lots of these patients. This is a big problem, potentially. It's compounded by the fact that if you look at incremental cost effectiveness, something called the ICER ratio of, of quality versus cost, we see that these procedures only become even marginally cost effective if they're not being revised, especially out to the five to 10 year time point. And that's pretty, pretty difficult to achieve. This is unpublished data, but some of the feedback I just got a week or two ago from some of our five year data in our combined database, it's a major complication rate in adult spinal deformity if you look at survivorship curves is over 90% out to five years. So we're not, we're not reaching this, this non-reoperation level of cost effectiveness, um, modeling this out to, the, um, to not being revised at five to 10 years. So what have the surgeons been doing? Well, we've been doing everything in our power to prevent failure, to try to reach this ICER curve, to try to prevent these patients from coming back and being reoperated on. What, what, why are they being reoperated on? Proximal junctional kyphosis, rod fracture, pseudoarthrosis. Those are kind of the main things driving it. So look at this patient. It's an older patient that we operate on at UCSF. She had a VCR. Um, she had some lumbar osteotomies, multiple rods, and uh, ligament tethers, and uh, BMP, and lots of things to prevent uh, revision. If you look at the numbers, this is from some of uh, Karina Zigarakis's work, who was a uh, resident with us. The use of inner body fusion is going up. The use of uh, BMP is going up. And this is not driven by some sort of commercial bias. This is driven because we're trying to prevent um, revision in these patients. We use double pelvis now, two pelvic screws per side, double rods, VCR rod, BMP2, ligament repair, vertebroplasty, two surgeons, plastic surgery. This is tremendously burdening the health system. And you know, the, the really unbelievable part of this, and just look at the data for, for pseudoarthrosis. You know, we save at least 10% rate of pseudoarthrosis with the use of BMP, but it increases the cost of the case by about $14,000. PJK, another cause of revision. Well, we developed a ligament tethering technique that at UCSF took this down from 17% to about 4% in terms of risk of PJF. Costs about 1,200 per side. We're not being re reimbursed for any of this. Either as a surgeon, there's no additional CPT code for this. We're not getting paid for vertebroplasty. We're not getting paid, the hospital's not getting paid for the use of the extra rods. Many times we're not being paid for BMP. This is all costs that the hospital system itself is absorbing. Uh, and the surgeons are absorbing the time and the medical legal risk of doing these extra procedures to try to prevent these patients from being revised. So this leads to a big problem. And this is some of the impetus for the development of this whole concept of risk stratification. 
Um, I'm going to give a talk in Minnesota uh, next week. Uh, Dave Polly invited me out. Dave Polly was president of the SRS uh, probably five years ago now, something like that, four or five years ago. And his idea was to dedicate some of the work of the SRS to risk stratification. And so the study groups uh, devoted themselves over the last five years or so into developing methodologies to risk stratify patients, to say, okay, maybe we shouldn't just globally apply ASD surgery or all of these techniques that cost money to everyone. We can be more targeted. We can be more precise. Um, and in the future, we're going to have to be smarter about it because we may have limited resources. The government may tell us or the payers may tell us, you can apply all this, all this revision prevention and all this ASD surgery to everyone. One of my good friends, Heiko Kohler, uh, who works in Germany, has been having to move around to a bunch of different hospitals because the hospital system in Germany is starting to lose faith and interest in funding ASD surgery. It's too expensive, too many revisions. It's already happening uh, in Europe. They're already rationing care in Europe. I just read an article, uh, maybe it was in uh, Bloomberg, I can't remember exactly, but they're rationing uh, surgical care in the UK now, in the NHS. So uh, tonsillectomy, breast reduction, hysterectomy, uh, all those things are going to be rationed. It's going to be much more difficult to get those operations done uh, in the UK. So if we, if we think this is not coming to the United States, we are wrong. When you look at all the numbers, all the hard walls that we're going to hit financially, it's not possible. And it doesn't look like, at least for the, the middle 75% uh, of American citizens, that their income is going to be dramatically increasing and feeding, feeding into that budget. So one of the approaches that was popularized up here uh, in Seattle was one of our ex-fellows, uh, uh, Raj Sethi. And he's become quite popular um, by saying, OK, well, let's limit care. Let's uh, have a multidisciplinary panel, and let's decide that we're not going to operate on patients that have, uh, are going to have higher complication rates. And maybe some of the more frail patients uh, we shouldn't operate on because they have risk factors for, for failure. And this has become quite popular with payers. Like they, um, large, uh, large companies are flocking to Virginia Mason because they're saying, oh, this guy's going to save us money, save us complications. This makes a lot of sense. But as humans, we have limited intelligence. And one of the other things that is a problem is that, of course, it's a foregone conclusion. If you limit operations to more robust patients and you're technically sound, you should have lower complication rates. The major problem with that is that the data indicates there's a major issue and failure of logic, which is that the most disabled patients actually do the best. <laughs> this was a paper that we published in the ISSG group looking at three-column osteotomy. Guess who did the best? Guess who had the greatest chance to reach MCID? The older patient. We developed a frailty index, which I'll talk about in a second. But we utilize frailty now to go back and segregate the patients by frailty and look at outcome. So the very patients that are the most frail, that these multidisciplinary panels that have been popularized are saying, OK, you shouldn't operate on the most frail patients, they had the greatest chance of reaching MCID. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. The least frail patients the ones that maybe don't have a lot of complications, say the 45-year-old the, the patient with a coronal uh, curve that they've had for 20 years that's going to have a low complication rate of that surgery, they're the ones that maybe would struggle to have a good uh, in improvement in their ODI or SRS-22. So where can we go with this? How can we be informed uh, in the new healthcare economy, in the age of informatics and AI? What can we do? Let's go back to the very beginning and look at what drives outcomes. You couldn't have gone to a spine meeting over the last 10 years and not seen this slide, OK? Everything was this Kool-Aid of the, the apical modifiers. And our, our study group was as guilty as any. <laughs> we, we, we potentiated a lot of this. We said, OK, the apical modifiers are what is linked and correlated to disability scores. So we should shoot to correct the modifiers, and the patients will do better. And that's, that's uh, evidence-based, and that's a good treatment paradigm. And you can pay less attention to the stuff on the left, but you got to reach the sagittal uh, realignment. Well, let's look at that for a second. This was the original paper that started the huge 
uh, epidemic, uh, we should say, of a three-column osteotomy and all this correction, trying to reach uh, an SVA of less than five. But where did this data really come from? Essentially, everybody was placed in a large bucket, and a regression was done looking at a moderate to severe disability, which was somewhat randomly set at an ODI of 40. And they looked at what, what the numbers showed. Where, what are those parameters? And that's where the modifiers came from. But what if you break it down by age and you add another 500 patients and you look at the R-squared values? Remember that the R-squared values that were published of the overall cohort, the best they got was about 0 0.35, 0 0.38 maybe for T1PA. If you look at the R-squared values, breaking it down by age, for SVA, for example, you see only the, the kind of the middle-aged patients had even a, a weak correlation to the SVA. And it gets even more complicated than that, as I'll show you toward the end of the talk. So it's not as simple as just looking at a somewhat approximately done, uh, certainly, a, certainly not a, a multivariate type of approach, to the sagittal plane, it's not as simple as linking our outcomes to the sagittal plane anymore. We need to look at the patient, the operation, many facets of the patient to plan our best surgery with the least cost and the least complication rates. And the age of big data now, as, a, as the large registries have shown us, and potentially the now electronic medical record can help us take advantage of this big data, that may be at least one approach. There's, there was a, there's a famous line in business school now that information is the new oil. Um, if you have information, if you have data points, that's more important than even the techniques to analyze it because those are re relatively easy to come by. So the data rules everything. With big data, we can determine complication rates and predict them. We can predict individual complication rates. We can predict outcomes, cost effectiveness. We can even potentially develop, as I'll show you at the end of the talk, uh, a, new a new classification system that may eventually uh, replace the Schwab classification that is designed around what we really care about, which is complications and outcomes, not just purely the sagittal plane. So let's look at this. One of the first things, and I, and I love to tell stories so that everyone understands where we came, how we came to be where we are right now. So the, the, the story of the research is, is to me as interesting as the research conclusions themselves because it's always in motion. We're always moving forward, okay? We're always trying to give the best information at the time. So our group said, okay, one approach is let's start looking at a better way to create a portrait of the patient. And rather than saying the patient is their ASA score or their Charleston comorbidity index or it's a surgeon's gestalt when he looks at somebody in their office, they, they don't, that guy doesn't look too good. What if we took an informatics approach to the patient and we tried to paint the patient with 40 different data points that span multiple organ systems and really created a physiologic substrate picture of that patient? So uh, Emily Miller in the ISSG uh, group, who was one of our uh, research students at the time, she worked with me um, and she looked through the, um, some of the due diligence work on how to create a frailty index. Frailty originally came from geriatrics, I think, Jens is going to talk about this in a few minutes, too. Well, we created a disease-specific adult spinal deformity frailty index based upon the granular data fields that we had in the ISSG, and we found that there was a very good correlation of frailty to major complication rates, and I, I'm not going to, it's not a talk on frailty, but many other things, pseudoarthrosis, readmission, length of stay, um, it's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good uh, correlation to all these major quality and value metrics. In an example of research lab to clinical practice, our frailty index through working with EPIC is now part of our EPIC system. So the ASD index that we created in the ISSG group is now inside our, our uh, EPIC system at UCSF. And it's auto-populated for about half of it, and the PAs populate the other half. And we now have a real-time um, uh, frailty index at the time of service. Think about as a surgeon, how useless a family practice review of systems is to you, right? The, the whole electronic medical record, the EHR, that was created for billing. That wasn't created to help you to predict what's best for your patient. So we've created essentially a disease-specific review of systems. 
that helps and informs the surgeon. And eventually, hopefully, the electronic records will move in the direction of helping through augmented intelligence inform the treating physicians and the patients as to what they should be doing, what it's going to cost, what are the potential red flags uh, in that pathway, um, rather than just a review of systems that's for billing that's, that's ridiculous, that's stupid, that no one looks at. But what if we took a, a better, even a better approach, a bigger approach? Frailty is only one part of the pr whole process. We also have the surgical invasiveness, the operation we're going to do, the facility we're going to do it in, the person that's going to do that surgery, the surgeon, and, and maybe some other factors that we haven't even thought of that maybe the computer can identify that we can't. And that's where we turn to big data and uh, predictive modeling. Uh, and that we did about three or four years ago, and I'll tell you the story of that uh, now. But you can't go on the internet. You can't subscribe to Becker's Orthopedics or any of these orthopedics today or even go, you know, have any news service on your phone, any feed that doesn't give you some, occasionally some information on how AI is being used in, in, in healthcare. AI now does a better job at identifying pneumonia on x-rays than radiologists. Uh, AI does a better job at identifying breast cancer. It does a better job at identifying melanoma than uh, pathologists. What makes us think that AI is not going to do a better job at identifying patients that are at risk for a poor outcome, that are at patients that may have high complication rates, but you know what? May do super well, actually. And, and red flags that can help us save cost. McKinsey, I just read this a few weeks ago, uh, the consulting firm in 2011 estimated that the appropriate application of predictive modeling to U.S. healthcare could save the U.S. healthcare industry $300 billion per year and via precision care, not operating on patients who are going to do poorly and have high complication rates, targeting care to patients that are likely to do well and benefit the most, perhaps, decrease waste, inventory management, census management, infection control, identif uh, rapid identification of, of clusters of infection, for example, things like that, and decreasing uh, complication. Predictive analytics essentially looks at everything at the same time. It looks at all the factors I just mentioned in terms of the patient substrate, the operation, the facility, uh, and allows us to play with it in real time at the point of care. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of why that might be better than its traditional approaches. This was a, a paper published by Kim. It's going to be presented at the SRS this year. Essentially, they compared AI to logistic regression. That was, that's been our standard. That's what's established a lot of our parameters and our sagittal alignment over the years. When they looked at AI-based uh, statistical techniques versus linear regression uh, and logistic regression, they found that AI did a better job at predicting complications than regression, 95% versus 62%. Also in being more specific and uh, sensitive, nine, again, 90 versus 60%. And the uh, area under the curve was approximately the same difference, 97% versus 61%. So if you look at it from purely a statistical standpoint, it looks like these uh, predictive modeling AI approaches do better, especially through deep learning uh, and neural networks. Here's another reason. So remember Justin Smith's excellent paper uh, about complication rates? So you, you read that paper and you'll say, OK, you're going to have about a 70% complication rate, right? Is that what you're going to quote your patient? Because that's the most recent large registry you know, report. You're, you're an adult patient. You're having an ASD surgery. Your complication rate is going to be about 70%. Well, this was a study uh, in, published in Quality of Life Research on hip replacement, 185,000 patients. Yeah. They found that every patient, you, you can't just report the average rate of improvement. 12 groups had less than a 70% improvement. 13 groups that the AI identified had more than a 90% improvement. Only 12,000 patients out of 185,000 fit the definition of the average patient. So if you're trying to use numbers that are reported in large series to, to counsel patients, it's not really accurate. Because how do you know that patient's really one of the average patients? Think about clinical trials. We extrapolate a tremendous amount of data out of randomized trials especially for like cancer research and, and uh, oncology drugs. But that really is only telling us that that drug worked that way on the patient that fit like the average patient enrolled uh, in those trials in a very homogeneous subset 
and, and not identifying uh, groups of patients that may be at, at risk of, of better improvement or less improvement. So here's the story of where we started. I actually, um, I had a, a very uh, brilliant student, uh, Justin Shear, uh, who was uh, a research student at UCSF. And he uh, got, uh, took some graduate courses in predictive analytics. And he worked with the ISSG, ISSG group. And we developed, uh, for the first time in 2015, some predictive models. We could predict uh, proximal junctional kyphosis. We could predict risk of major complication. We could predict the, um, whether someone was going to reach MCID on their ODI uh, back in 2015 using simple decision tree modeling. This wasn't neural network. This wasn't deep learning. Um, and we did pretty well. If PJF costs $55,000, actually, we looked at this again. PJF's now up to about $7,500,000. <laughs> this was uh, old data that we published uh, years ago in terms of the cost of the reoperation. The ability to predict pre-op, someone that has a high risk of PJF might say, OK, in that patient, we should apply ligament tethering. Maybe we don't need to apply it in everyone. Vertebroplasty, we should take the risk of injecting cement in that patient, because that patient's at high risk, whereas this procedure and this patient is at lower risk of that. So we can target resources and target risk uh, more appropriately. We were 86% accurate in predicting PJF pre-op. So we thought, well, you know, we're on to something here. Let's, let's move into a second gener generation of models. But we also wanted to continue to focus on the quality and value uh, areas. So one of the other things we looked at was pseudoarthrosis. Uh, remember, that's one of the main causes of delayed revision. That's why patients often are being revised two years, five years out, which is a big problem for those patients. Um, we could predict pseudoarthrosis pre-op with 91% accuracy. We could predict length of stay uh, with about 75% accuracy within two days. And we could predict uh, a bit of cost effectiveness. And I'm, one of the interesting things about the pseudoarthrosis model, and I'm not going to go into it in detail, is that you could add or subtract the use of biologics. And it would get, give you your pseudoarthrosis rate with, the use of bi, uh, with or without biologics. So again, applying expensive resources, perhaps resources that have some risk, uh, more intelligently. Well, this was kind of the holy grail at the time for us, was trying to figure out, and this is a slide that I got from Matt McGirt, we want to try to apply our resources to the patients that are going to have the best results with the least complications, potentially, and, and certainly not with the highest cost. And so we developed a model that would predict uh, patients most likely to reach uh, MCID, as I showed you uh, in the first modeling slide. And we said, well, what if we apply that model to our decision making in our ASSD, data, ASSD database and we only operated according to that model. And this was a simulation study versus we operated according to the surgeons. Of course, the patients all had surgery. <laughs> well, if we use the model, we did much better. We saw a significant increase in the qualities gained from an overall health population than we did if we just operated based upon surgeon, surgeon decision making. So we saw an increase in the group overall quality, population quality, essentially, of the registry. So this made us think, wow, we're really on to something here, potentially. Um, there's a lot of support. Uh, there was a lot of support for this work within the SRS and within uh, the research groups. And you know, we said, we need to kick it up another notch, um, given our past success. And so just last year, we entered into a large collaboration with the European group and Ferran Police and the ESSG. And we've now fostered the beginning of, of an Asia ISSG. And essentially, what we want to have is uh, worldwide databases uh, next in South America so that we can do worldwide analytics. We started with a collaboration with the European group. Uh, we have 17 sites now, 35 surgeons. And we brought on an incredibly brilliant full-time PhD uh, named Miguel Serra, who's based in Barcelona, who has a PhD in informatics and economics. And the models that I'm going to show you now represent the absolute latest uh, models that are on the podium uh, this year and some of the calculator work uh, that we've been doing. So we developed a rudimentary model a couple years ago that predicted major, whether someone would have a major complication, yes, no. <laughs> that was all, all we could say. We couldn't even say percent. We couldn't say uh, any of the other things. So one of the main focuses uh, initially was to 
get much more granular and much more uh, precise in our ability to predict a patient's uh, survival without complication, uh, without readmission, without reoperation. And wouldn't it be nice if when you're talking to the patient in the office, you could essentially have the whole database at your disposal. For a community surgeons, you could have the benchmark database at your disposal. And you could say, you know what, Mrs. Jones, you're going to be about here in our database. This is you. This is uh, our prediction of your complication rate over time. And you might get out of surgery and have only a 10% complication risk in the hospital. But over time, as we look at you over one to two years, this is how your complication rate is likely to look, your readmission rate, your reoperation rate. So we wanted to make it much more specific, and we also wanted to look at it at different time horizons, at different time points. Because obviously we can be more accurate if we predict a little bit later. So for example, I mean, and you might say, well, why is that in interesting? The surgery already happened. Of course, if we include the, the patient, the surgical procedure, the surgeon, we're getting more accurate before surgery. But after surgery, if we include the blood loss, the CSF leak, the intraoperative events, we get even more accurate at predicting post-operative complications during the hospital, say. How could this be interesting? Well, you could say you could use this as an actual AI augmented post-op timeout, where you debrief, where you say, based upon the AI, this says you, you have a 75% risk of an event in the first two days, you should go to the ICU. We don't have to put everyone in the ICU that has these big procedures. It would identify patients that would be at higher risk, and therefore they would go to the ICU. So save ICU beds, save money. Well, readmission in the US costs the healthcare system 42 a billion dollars a year, uh, per year, just just uh, 90 day readmission. So what if we could at the time of discharge identify patients that are at risk of readmission? We can touch back with that patient, have the PA and P resident fellow call the patient, say, how are you doing? Are you having any issues? Ask them specifically about things that might drive their readmission uh, and potentially prevent readmission. And as we see, because we didn't just predict major complication yes, no, we predicted major complication on a time horizon, we have the ability to have all this information. Well, we found that patient-related factors um, over the count, accounted for about 55% of the risk of major complication. And very interestingly, a third of the factors that contributed to the prediction of the complication were mo potentially modifiable, things like preoperative uh, activity levels, potentially some psychological uh, issues and, uh, and, uh, and things like that. So this raises the issue of prehab. So we can now start to optimize our patients. We can improve their bone density. We can send them to psychological counseling. We can try to take them from sedentary to at least intermittently active, which decreases our major complication rate through aggressive and, um, and, and precise uh, pre prehab uh, protocols. And this is, again, an example of research informing clinical practice. Interestingly, we found that surgeon and site only accounted for about 4 to 10% of the variability in uh, complications, but were more important for readmission and unplanned reoperation than they were just for major complication. And this was less role of the surgeon than we expected. Um, this might be because many of the surgeons in the large uh, registries uh, have a lot of experience already. The next thing we wanted to focus on with our new, uh, more sophisticated modeling techniques was outcome. And this year uh, on the podium um, at IMAST and uh, NAS, and uh, uh, we're presenting this, this uh, model. Essentially, now we can predict with uh, a range in accuracy of about 50% to about 80% depending upon which specific uh, uh, prom you look at, we can predict uh, the likelihood of any improvement, likelihood of deterioration, and likelihood of MCID improvement uh, at one and two years post-op across all proms. And we can predict this pre-op. And I'll show you uh, the, the top predictors. What is interesting about those predictors? You only see one sagittal plane. <laughs> It's a pre-op SVA, and we've double and triple checked this, and improvement, for example, in SVA, post-op SVA, is completely washed out by the overwhelming influence of things like where the patient starts and their baseline status. 
and other aspects of their, of their um, substrate. These are the sample curves uh, that we, we generate. So we, we can generate distributions of likelihood um, across all the uh, outcome measures. This is our, our overall data, uh, average data. 570 patients contributed to this from 17 hospitals. Overall, we had up to about 82% predictive power. And this is the interesting thing. At the time of, at the, time of the op, uh, pre-op visit, we can run simulations. So we can say, this is your baseline likelihood of improvement right now. We can wait five years and let you deteriorate a bit more. And then you're going to have a higher chance of reaching MCID. And we can adjust whether we do a T10 or a, a T4 termination and look at that effect on your MCID. But patients don't want to know whether their SF36 is going to improve or whether their PCS is going to improve. Patients want to know, am I going to be able to, not, to walk without a walker? Am I going to have less pain? They have very specific and precise goals for their surgery. We've done some work on this with patient-generated in, uh, indices. Just the other day, I thought she was like reading, a, reading one of my uh, papers or like looking at one of my PowerPoints. I had a patient that, that literally told me, I don't want to have this surgery unless I don't have to use a walker anymore. That's my entire reason for having this surgery. If you can't guarantee me that, I, I don't want to have this ASD surgery. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I'm going to run you through one of the calculators. <laughs> I'm going to have our, our, our PhD run the calculator on you because I'm so, I'm so excited that you have such a specific goal and um, decision node for whether or not you want to have this operation. So they want to know whether they're going to walk better, return to work, their pain's going to improve. So we went back to Miguel and we said, well, could you actually predict the answers to the individual SRS-22 questions. And he, he, um, he took about a week and he came back and he said, you know, I can do that even better than I can predict the overall uh, MCID. And so with about 75 to 80% accuracy, he was able to predict the answers to each SRS-22 question at one and two years post-op. Which to me, that, that's unbelievable. <laughs> and so uh, we, for this model, he used 150 uh, different variables and uh, did best at predicting pain and activity, and did least well in predicting depression and, and uh, domestic activity, for example. And here's an example of some of the simulations that we can run. So this patient, uh, wanted, this is a female patient, 40 years old, no prior spine surgery. You can read the demographics there. She wanted to uh, have an improvement in her back pain at rest. Okay, So we run the pre-op uh, model, gives us a 77% chance of that. She has surgery, we run the model, 80% chance because the surgery went really well. It's roughly in line with the model. What about this patient who wanted to improve their current level of activity? They wanted to improve function. We run the model pre-op, uh, and it gives us a close to a 70% chance. But at surgery, the patient has a foot drop. And prior to discharge, we know that that patient's chance of improving their level of activity is now less than 50%. We can rerun the model and adjust our expectations and our information for the patient based upon real-time data feeding back uh, into the models. And here you can see an, a, a sample output of what we're able to give for each question in the SRS uh, 22. To me, potentially, this is one of the most interesting aspects, and this is getting at uh, the one of the new exciting priority projects for the ISSG ESSG group, which is the development of a new ASD uh, classification. So as surgeons, we think every patient's a little bit different. I'm a very differentiated surgeon. I have, one, I have incredibly creative and wonderful ideas about how to treat you. Um, and I'm such a genius, and no one's going to treat you exactly the same. And so there must be a million different permutations of, of what can be recommended to patients and different types of patients. Well, right now, as a surgeon, when you look at a patient, you might look at their, their ODI score. You look at their BMI, their ASA grade. You measure them out. And that's how in your brain you have a bunch of different data points, but not that many, maybe 10, 10, 12 data points. Though this is how the machine sees that patient. At the point of care, immediately, the machine is able to say, okay, Mrs. Jones, you're not those five or 10 different numbers. This is you. This is your position inside a data. And this is actually a graphical representation of the combined ISSG, ESSG database. And it can position that patient immediately next to their 10 nearest neighbors, 
to identify and pull out those cases. How did they do? How were they treated? What complications did they have? What are the risk factors? And it can cluster those patients. So what we did was we turned the AI loose in an unsupervised fashion, which means that we weren't tweaking it and adjusting it. We're letting the AI run through and do clustering to identify different patient clusters and types. And you know what the machine said? This is just an example of the 10 nearest neighbors. The machine said, you know, you don't have all those many different types of patients and surgeries. In our current database, you have uh, three different kinds of patients and you essentially do four different kinds of surgery. And for the first time, we can cluster patients and surgeries together on a complication versus outcome graph. And so if someone is in a cluster that has poor outcome and high complication rates, and that's where they cluster, we classify that patient now as someone not likely to do well with surgery. And here's the important differentiating factor, is we can classify a patient now who has high complication rate, but is still likely to do very well, right? And that's the difference from using purely uh, human intelligence and even collective human intelligence in multidisciplinary panels. And here's just the example of the new ASD uh, cluster classification where we have four different types of, of surgeries, three different types of patients, and we have the complication rates and the likelihood of reaching MCID for each type, each cluster. And in the next year, we want to develop that further and refine it and make it more user-friendly so that we can have a really user-friendly, uh, employable, uh, widely uh, distributed uh, new ASD classification. And I'm just going to finish with this to show you now uh, our real-time uh, calculators. And so th this is going to be on the web. Um, it's already in alpha testing, and it's already on the web for the ISSG surgeons. And this is what it's going to look like. 60-year-old male, you can read it there. It's essentially ASD patient, measured out with the risk calculator. And this is the interface. This is the uh, global spine analytics uh, interface that will, you will have on your computer. And you enter the patient profile information. This can be entered by your PA, radiographic information, HRQOL, pre-op HRQOL data, surgical data. Remember, you can go back and play with this. T10 to pelvis, T4 to pelvis, PSO, SPO, inner body, no inner body. And this is what you get. Major and at the, right at the point of care, within 10 seconds, major complications over two years, including in hospital, reoperation, re readmission from zero to two years, likelihood of improvement, likelihood of MCID improvement, SRS 22, MCID, all the different subdomains. And this, that particular patient had a length of stay six days had a, a medical complication of some uh, transient uh, arrhythmia. So um, thank you all very much for your attention and uh, appreciate again the invitation here, Bob. Thanks.